Hello everyone, welcome back to the real-time black hole projects. In this video we will finish the accretion disk and with it this series of videos. There are three more physical effects to be added. The first two are relativistic beaming and the relativistic Doppler effect. They describe the effect of the velocity of the gas in the disk on the intensity and frequency of the emitted light. So even though the two effects have a different name, they are really two sides of the same coin. Together they describe the effect of relativistic motion of the gas on the emitted light. The gas in an accretion disk can go very fast, especially close to the black hole it can reach a large fraction of the speed of light. When gas is moving this fast, these relativistic effects play a major role. The third physical effect is gravitational Doppler shift. This is an effect of the gravitational field of the black hole on light emitted or received in the vicinity of the black hole. We'll start with beaming and relativistic Doppler effects and discuss a gravitational Doppler shift afterwards. Normally, describing relativistic beaming and the relativistic Doppler effect requires going through quite a bit of mathematics. However, we are lucky today. It turns out that a blackbody spectrum under these relativistic effects is still a blackbody spectrum, but with a different temperature. The apparent temperature of the blackbody is the original temperature times what I like to call the Doppler shift factor. It is the same factor that describes a change in frequency of light emitted by a moving source. It looks like this, where this gamma is as usual the relativistic gamma factor, and beta is the orbital speed divided by c. This theta d is the angle between the view direction and the velocity of the gas. We can unpack this equation a bit and replace gamma with its expression. This is the equation we'll have to implement. We'd like to have control over the strength of this beaming effect in our shader. As discussed in the previous video, the orbital speed is proportional to r to the power of minus 1 over 2. The absolute maximum strength of the beaming effect we can do is to have the gas at the inner edge of the disk orbit at the speed of light. The inner edge is at 6m, so we can write this expression for beta, where sb is the beaming strength. If sb is 1, we have the maximum possible beaming strength. And if sb is 0, there is no beaming. There is one caveat here. This angle, theta d, is the angle between the velocity of the gas and the view direction at the intersection point of the ray with the disk. We have to take into account the bending of light rays here. Consider a light ray orbit, which intersects a disk at some point. We have to calculate this direction. Luckily, we already have everything we need from previous calculations. For any point on the orbit, we have a way to calculate this angle, which we call alpha. So what we can do is to calculate alpha at the camera position, which I'll call alpha c, as well as at the intersection point, which I'll call alpha d. Then we take the view vector and rotate it by alpha d minus alpha c. This is basically what we did for the light of the skybox, but then using alpha d minus alpha c instead of the total angle swept out. This does mean we need one more texture, alpha of phi and b. I don't want to go over the code in much detail, but I'll discuss the key points. We have the same issue as before when we did the accretion disk. We can calculate alpha from r and b, but not from phi and b. So we first have to calculate r from phi and b, like we did before, and then we calculate alpha from that r. So this texture also takes a long time to calculate. In our main loop, we differentiate between before the turning point, after the turning point, and invalid values of phi beyond the total angle swept out. We also need to decide on a range of phi, which I took to be 0 to 4 pi. We do need to take this range quite large, otherwise the second intersection might look incorrect. 4 pi is definitely overkill, but I might want to add a third intersection, and in that case you do need this range. I just haven't added the third intersection yet, because I'm afraid the shader graph editor would slow down even more, and it's already barely workable. Let's start with alpha. This is a simple subgraph taking in phi and b. Like we have done many times now, we calculate the uvs. 5.1962 divided by b is the u-coordinate, and phi divided by 4 pi is the v-coordinate. And then we sample our texture. All of the work is going to be done in the disk color subgraph. Let's start with calculating the ray vector at the intersection point. To do this, we start with the view vector, normalized, and we're going to rotate it. For the rotation angle, we need to calculate alpha twice. 
once at the intersection point and once at the camera position. Subtract the latter from the former and that's our angle. The axis of rotation can be found by taking the camera location and taking the cross product with the view vector. Next, we need the direction of movement of the gas in the disk at the intersection point. Since the gas is orbiting in a circular orbit, this is pretty easy to do. We can rotate the unit vector in the z direction by phi d with the vertical axis as rotation axis. Whether we take a vector in the positive or negative z direction depends on the direction of rotation. So we make a parameter for the rotation direction, which is either 1 or negative 1. Taking the dot product of these two gives a cosine of theta d. Remember, this is the equation we're implementing, so the cosine is just what we need. Next we do beta. We had this equation for that, whereas b is a parameter for the beaming strength. Finally, we implement the rest of the equation for the Doppler shift factor. Then we can simply multiply the temperature of the disk by this. In the main shader, we have a bunch more things to connect now. All of these inputs are directly available in the shader, except for the rotation direction, which is the sign of the rotation speed. And then for the second intersection, we need to do the same. That is beaming and the relativistic Doppler shift taken care of. Now it's time to discuss the gravitational Doppler shift. Consider an observer infinitely far away from the black hole and light emitted at a distance re from the black hole. The light that observer sees is redshifted due to the gravitational field of the black hole. The frequency at infinity is the emitted frequency multiplied by this factor. Now consider an observer at a distance rc from the black hole and light emitted from infinitely far away. This light is blue shifted as the observer frequency is a frequency at infinite distance multiplied by this factor. Combining these two gives us a general equation for the Doppler shift of light emitted at a distance re and observed at distance rc. For our shader this has two effects. Light from the disk is Doppler shifted, this can be either red shifted or blue shifted, and light from the skybox is blue shifted. The latter was the something with the environment I mentioned in the last video. I tried to implement this, and I somewhat did using severe implications, but there is one problem for which there isn't really a solution. The skybox is just an image with RGB values, right? If we blue shift that a little, blue is going to shift towards ultraviolet, green is going to shift towards blue, and red is going to shift towards green. The problem is red. There would be infrared light being shifted towards red, but we don't have any infrared. With the camera at 3M, this blue shift would be so strong that almost all of the light of the skybox is shifted out of the visible spectrum. So to do this, we would really need the skybox in the near infrared as well. This isn't necessarily an unsolvable problem, there might be a clever way to extrapolate RGB components towards three near-infrared components and get somewhat believable results, but this would be a whole project on its own, so I decided to just not include the blue shift of the skybox in the shader. For the disk, we already did some red shifting and blue shifting when implementing the relativistic Doppler shift. We can simply adjust the temperature of the disk to do so. Only now there is no beaming corresponding with the Doppler shift, so the brightness shouldn't change, only the color. This means we'll have to do something clever in the shader to undo the brightness increase due to us changing the temperature. In the disk color subgraph, we start by implementing the equation for the gravitational Doppler shift and multiply the temperature by it. Then to undo the brightness change we introduce by doing so, we can take the temperature from here and convert that to a color. Then we take the length of both of these and divide one by the other. If we multiply our color by this factor, we get the color of this one, but the brightness of this one. Back in the main shader, we then need to connect RC. Let's take a look at the results. 
If we increase the strength of the beaming effect, you can see what it does. The side of the disc that is rotating away from the camera becomes dimmer and redder, while the side coming towards the camera becomes brighter and bluer. This is actually an effect that is often not done in visualizations of black holes. For example, in the movie Interstellar they didn't add this effect, because in their shot the spaceship would then be moving towards the dark side of the disc, which doesn't really work in terms of composition. So they purposely took out this part of physics. So in a way, admittedly in a very specific way, we can now say that this black hole is more physically accurate than the one in Interstellar. Now that the series is done, there are a few things I'd like to discuss. First off, let's talk about the limitations of the shader. It is not possible to draw anything other than the black hole. Unless you write your own render engine and do ray tracing, this is just not something you can do. And at that point, I doubt you could do it in real time. If you have nothing behind the black hole, you could cheat a bit and render everything without the bending of light, and only consider the bending of light when drawing the black hole. So in that specific use case, you can draw other objects with a normal render engine. Next, I'd like to discuss missing physics. As I said before, we are not doing the blue shifting of the skybox. From the experiments I did, I think this would look really cool, but solving that problem would take me probably another few weeks of research, and I simply don't have the time for that now. Another thing we're missing is jets. In astrophysics, it seems that disks tend to produce jets of material shooting out in the direction perpendicular to the disk plane. This is definitely the case for accretion disks around black holes, we can literally see them, because the jets are larger than galaxies. We just have to look in the radio domain. But it's also the case for many other types of disks, like protoplanetary disks around forming stars, or even disks around evolved binary systems. The thing is that, as far as I know, there is no profound physical understanding of how these jets are formed yet. So we actually don't know how the jet looks close to the black hole. In real accretion disks around black holes, there is also a lot more going on than in our neatly rotating disk. There are outflows of gas powered by radiation-driven winds, there are failed winds that get pushed out by radiation but then fall back onto the black hole. All of these things are just now starting to be attempted to be modeled in cutting-edge research. One thing that we do know is that close to the black hole, the gas doesn't orbit in Keplerian rotation at all. It does spiral inwards rather quickly. It's only at larger radius that Keplerian rotation is a good approximation. I've tried to come up with a way to have gas at large radii orbit in circular orbits, and transition to an in-spiral closer to the black hole, but I couldn't find a way to do it. Finally, the way light is bent in our shader is assuming a non-rotating black hole. In reality, however, black holes do rotate, usually quite rapidly as well. Space-time around rotating black holes is no longer described by the Schwarzschild metric, but the Kerr metric, which is a lot more complicated as the spherical symmetry is broken. And finally, finally, as I said in the first video, I will make this shader available for free on the Unity Asset Store. I still have to make a package out of it, but it will go up sometime in the near future. I'll add a link in the description of every video when that goes up. I think I've said everything I wanted to. I do want to thank you all for watching. This series has been a lot of work for me, and I have to say it's nice to see people are interested in a topic so niche as this. With the academic year starting, I don't know when I'll be able to make a new video, or what it's going to be about. But when I do release a new video, I hope to see you there!